Welcome everybody. Thank you for having made it here, running from the previous session that we understood uh, uh, ended a bit later. So we decided to, well, we have less time, so we decided to have a different format for the session. We will start with a short introduction. We will leave the floor to the speakers and then we will open up the space for questions and interactive exchanges. So can I invite um, everybody in the back to maybe sit uh, around the table if there are some free seats um, um, available. So good morning, everybody, and welcome. You've been here for a couple of days, uh, either participating in the Tic Tac Forum or the Integrity Forum that is happening, uh, that are happening at the moment. Um, starting with introducing ourselves, my name is Barbara Obaldi, and I lead the work on digital government and open data at the OECD. And my colleague, uh, Alessandro Bellantoni, who is the head of the open government Correct. work at the OECD. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the fact that we are organizing this session together is a little bit a testimony of the approach that we would like to take at the OECD, which is uh, overcoming a little bit the silo approach we see in some countries, um, leading to digital government strategies, open data strategies, open government strategies and policies and initiatives that are disconnected. And also, we would like to move a little bit beyond the hype of thinking that all the new opportunities and tools that we have available um, provide automatically uh, the way for having more collaborative democracy, meaning more um, in integration of users' needs and, and uh, opinions in the way we design policies, we design services, and we bring value to all our citizens. So a little bit the discussion we would like to have with you here today is, yes, let's recognize that this is an age where we have new opportunities, but let's also see if this is really happening um, or not. So if this digital um, era is actually bringing our governments closer to the society. And this, I leave the floor to Ale. But the same, sorry. <laughs> so good, good, good afternoon. Uh, as Barbara said, one of the one of the tasks that the open government unit at the OECD has given to itself is in fact that of going to countries that are already pretty active in the fields of uh, participatory democracy especially in how new technologies is informing uh, these practices and go there and test whether the principles of democracy uh, inclusiveness and participation are in fact upheld uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the way these this, this practices are shaped. Uh, and what we are seeing more and more is, in fact, uh, that we have a lot of uh, isolated uh, uh, success stories uh, that are very uh, inspiring and that uh, are even successful sometimes, not, not all the time. Uh, but this is not yet being transformed in the new way democracy works. Uh, at the local level, maybe more than at the central level, uh, but we, are, we feel there's a sort of an experimentation kind of phase that is being protected, and, and perhaps it's about time to stop this, uh, 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 this kind of uh, uh, improvised approach and maybe transform this practice into institutionalized, solid, robust methodologies that can allow uh, uh, governments and, and at all levels uh, to really better include the voice and the views of all stakeholders in their policy making cycles and in service delivery. So in this session, we only have less than an hour, but uh, we'll try to be as concise as possible. But also, we would like to explore how this can happen uh, and how this can affect the quality of policies and services. And since we have great speakers with us, I will leave the floor to the speakers to share with us a little bit their first thoughts about the reality and how opportunities and challenges are actually being um, um, connected at the moment, starting with Moore, who's a friend. Um, for those who don't know Moore, I will introduce her, uh, underlining some of the few of the things that she's been doing in the past few years and she's responsible for. Uh, Moore is um, a manager at Data Labs at 360 Giving, which is um, uh, an initiative that aims to um, basically um, help governments to have more evidence-based, impactful, and strategic approaches. Um, and that's also very complementary to the other um, head that brings her here today, which is being the founder of Open Heroines, which has the mission to give a visible platform for women uh, to uh, express their thoughts, ideas, and critique. But Moore has also been extremely active in the open data community, and she has very critical, uh, constructive thoughts. So maybe you can share some of your ideas and experiences on some of the open questions that we put on the table more. Okay. Yeah. 
Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm working with the philanthropic sectors, with government, and with civil society. And what I learned in the past few years is that it all comes to design. And unfortunately, government and civil society do not have all the capacity to understand design or to run design sessions. So when we're speaking about how to be more collaborative, how to be more democratic, and how to create better processes, we need to look at these designs. But I think in reality we don't, even when we look at our technologies. And even though it's um, something that we see in the open data movement, at least, like this discussions of like starting to look at user-centered design and how to implement it, in reality, it's little to be done. And I actually can't really blame government for not doing it. It's something that they're not used to do when thinking about these processes in tech and collaboration. They have like old fashioned waterfall designs that used to work in the past but do not work now. And to be fair, sometimes they still work for government because they can still keep doing their work forever. And why do I think design? Because if we do want to basically understand how these processes work, we need to look at intersectionality. We need to look at gender, we need to look at age, we need to look at location, and we need to look at all of them together. What helps for women in their 30s probably will not help to women in their 60s. Sometimes it is, sometimes it, don't, it doesn't, but most of our design processes in government are not done by this intersectionality. They're usually done as population, and as Caroline Carrido Perez wrote in our new book, that I recommend to read and to be critical about the gender data gap. Um, the um, we the invisible actually women. the <laughs> invisible women exactly. Uh, we usually when we design we design thinking of a person and a person usually in 95% of the cases will be a man, um, and it will be a very uh, in a man in good health. Let's say that. So we don't look at disabilities. We don't look at other proportions of body. We don't look at other proportions on language as well. Language is really important when coming to speak to people. So it's not only the technology itself, it's what we write on that technology. And sometimes because of all the hype, as Barbara said, we are lacking these languages. And our country is becoming more diverse and speaking more and more languages, even though some people don't want that. So it's really important to understand how to design that and not necessarily how to also design a great UX, although user interface should be good and great to everybody. But again, I don't know how to answer how to create this design to government and how to do it. Like we know the data literacy is lacking, so I'm pretty sure the design lit like literacy is lacking even more, and I'm pretty sure that most governments will not have a user interface designer or UX designer on board. Um, so we need to look also in that. And lastly, because we only have five minutes, uh, if we want to make people to feel like they can speak, they need to feel that their voice is heard, but that nothing will happen to them. We need to design safe spaces to create them, and we are lacking that at all. Um, even in our nice initiative like the Open Government Partnerships or Others, it's really hard sometimes to voice, to, to feel like you can voice. I voice all the time because I'm very rude and I'm liking it. But other people, <laughs> but other people will not feel comfortable with it, specifically women. Uh, so we need to make sure that when women do voice, exp like voice um, their concern, they're being heard and they're not being bullied. Luckily, it never happened to me, but a lot of other women that I speak to did happen to them, and this is the reason why they don't speak. And I don't know how we create this mechanism within government to make it happen, but what usually happens when you do speak to government and raise this concern is that they become more in the defensive. And this is something that I don't think tech can help, how to make people to understand that this is not a critique, this is feedback, and how to get this feedback in without feeling on the defense. Because at the end of the day, and I work, like in my home country in Israel, I work with many um, public officials and they always like to hear the pat on the back and how they done well and every time you tell them that something went wrong after that they're shutting off completely men and women so we need to make sure that when they do hear this feedback they get this feedback and understanding and I don't know yet how to create it within a machine that will make this feedback heard in a nicer way so at the end of the day yes tech is really nice but we need to look at all of this like human design that we need to think about of how to create this feedback and actually make people feel safe, listen, and actually part of the process by being designed. Because we can never design to the whole population, so let's think how we like tackle one population at a time or one population that is relevant for the topic and how we can actually move forward. Well, thank you. So, no better speaker on this than Claudia Schwalis who is now, I can probably say, a colleague of ours. She's a member of the Open Government team. 
Uh, but Claudia, before joining the OECD, has been uh, working on deliberative processes for quite some time, and she's the author of the book, The People's Verdict, Adding Informed Citizens' Voices to Public Decision Making. So, Claudia, some thoughts you can share with us? Great, yes, thanks very much. And uh, I think what I'm about to say really follows nicely what Miriam was just talking about, um, because the, the kind of overarching question of how we, we framed the session and that I was thinking about when preparing these notes was how, to, how do we involve everyday people from all walks of life directly in policy making, but in such a way that actually allows them to give a constructive and an informed point of view and input into public decision making. Um, so those two aspects are, are really key and often we, we get top of mind opinions or we're asking not very representative groups of people what they think about things. Um, but there, there is ever increasing evidence that through using these longer form deliberative processes like citizens' assemblies, for instance, um, we're able to actually try and counter those two parts. So breaking apart that, that question, there are two parts of it. First, how do we involve everyday people in, into um, participation? So there are two elements to that. The first is that it actually has to be a meaningful opportunity to change things. I think we all have an innate, an innate sense of when our time is being wasted, uh, but when we know that what we're going to devote maybe a few a few weekends to um, will actually have a direct impact on one of the policies that's affecting our lives, our community. There's oh, like overwhelming evidence that people are more than willing to actually give up that time when they're asked to do so. So the first is actually having that meaningful opportunity. The second um, is through through sortition or random selection. Um, sometimes this is called a civic lottery. Uh, and this means that you really give everybody an equal opportunity to be selected in the first place. Um, it means it often comes in the form of everybody, or not everybody, it's usually around 10 to 30,000 people will receive a letter from their mayor or their minister or a public authority inviting them to participate in this citizens assembly on you know, whatever local issue or it could be a national issue. Will you give up? four or five weekends of your time to help give us recommendations which we will then act upon. So through combining those two things, you still end up with some sort of self-selection bias. So you still have um, the people who are more likely to participate, which tend to be men uh, who are white and well off and well educated. Um, and, and there's a lot of research which backs that up. But when you combine it with the meaningful, um, you know, when it's a, an invite from someone who actually has authority, you also get the people who have never gone to a town hall meeting, who have never voted, who have never participated in any other way. So you do end up actually reaching everyday people from all walks of life and being able to bring them together. Um, so that's the one aspect. And then the second aspect is how, how do you engage people in a way that actually allows them to give an informed perspective rather than just what they think off the top of their minds about something. Um, and here that's where you actually need to give the time and the resources to allow people to deliberate. I mean deliberation when you, when you look at the definition it means long and careful discussion. Uh, it, it implies that it's actually it's the best arguments that went out rather than just the loudest voices or the most money behind something or, or the biggest push uh, behind coming from, from that sense. Um, so a lot of the deliberative processes that take place, they, people meet for four, five, six weekends over numerous months uh, because that's, that's the only way you can get to grips of a really complex issue, to hear from lots of experts, to read about it, to also have time in between those meetings to talk to your family, to your friends, to your colleagues about what you're up to and also feed their opinions in. Um, also, a lot of these processes tend to combine, um, be combined with other forms of engagement. So for instance, in between, in the middle of these meetings, there might be a public town hall where the participants of the randomly selected assembly will answer questions, will also get feedback, Back from the wider public, which they then bring into the rest of their deliberations. Um, and then the, the last ex, um, element of that which is important is that these are moderated discussions, which mean that um, 
it's not just the people who feel the most comfortable who end up dominating the discussions because there's someone there who facilitates those discussions and makes sure that everybody really has an equal chance to speak and to have their, their voice reflected in. And, um, and, and so the combination of these two things really allows that to happen. And we've heard one example of how this is being done in reality, which is about to, to kick off in, in the UK, but it's been a long time that in some countries, um, I mean, I'm most familiar with the, the research that I've done in Canada and Australia, where it's been about a decade that governments at all levels of governance, local, regional, state, provincial, and national, uh, have used these randomly selected assemblies to help, help them solve big and important issues like developing um, national strategies to tackle obesity, to 30-year infrastructure investment plans, uh, developing new housing legislation. So really big issues um, that they've been done on. And one, one of the more interesting developments that's been happening is something which Alessandro touched on in, in his introductory remarks, that it's moving from being just away from being just these one-off ad hoc initiatives to being institutionalized as a normal way of doing things in some places. Uh, so just three weeks ago in the German-speaking region of Belgium, the parliament there has now put in place a, a randomly selected citizens council, which is 24 people, who will actually have an agenda setting power. They will decide on what are the one, two or three issues every year that will go to a randomly selected citizens assembly who will have three months at least to tackle and give recommendations to the parliament on that issue. So it's, a, it's really starting to change the infrastructure of our democracies and bringing people into the picture in a way that complements our representative institutions but gives them more power. Thank you very much. I think uh, <coughs> this morning we had a session on the use of big data for supporting anti-corruption um, efforts and policies. And I think one of the clear messages that came from the, mod from the panelists but also from the participants was make it democratic. If you use data uh, to show you know, decisions, make it possible for the common people, the average person, mm -hmm. to actually understand, use, and interact. And I think so that's a very common message. That brings me to the last panelist who's been working for quite some time on uh, issues that um, are cross-cutting between the digital discourse and narrative and the open government discourse and narrative, Amanda Clark. She's assistant professor at the School of Public Policy and Administration at Carleton University. And Amanda, in 2019, launched uh, the book Opening the Government of Canada, the Federal Bureaucracy in the Digital Age, which precisely looks at the response of government to new opportunities like social media, crowdsourcing, open data, user-centered design. So how can we make sure that as the government matures in its capacity to be ready to take up the opportunities of the digital age, doesn't forget all these key issues that are those that remain relevant to make all these efforts um, pur purposeful and useful for everybody. Great. Thank you. Um, and I'll thank the others for their uh, interventions as well. So I mean, I thought what I'd use my five minutes for is, is to, to just return to the question of you know, what we know from research so far and what I've seen in my own work on um, how to generate more inclusive policy making, which is really the focus of, of this whole session. So I have five quick points to make. Um, the first, I think, is that I mean, some of these return to basics right, they, they're sort of technology neutral and we can find a long history of research on citizen engagement that would support these findings. Um, the first is, I think, to really be clear about what your goal is. So is your goal to use the engagement to give more political legitimacy or democratic license to government policy um, decisions? Or is it to tap expertise or is it both? Um, and I think that will really shape how inclusive you need to be because it shapes the question of, you know, well, how many stakeholders do I need um, around that table? I mean, I've spoken to civil servants who say a truly um, helpful form of engagement on this policy would mean that I actually bring in, like, the six experts on this topic or the seven industry groups that work on this, which is different from a process where you would say we want to bring in a representative cross-section of citizens. Um, and so I think being clear about what your objective is, is it legitimacy or expertise or both can be helpful. Um, the second thing I think that's useful to remember is to not assume the availability and willingness of 
citizens to participate in some of these processes, which is one of the big assumptions that I think we, we all fall into. We're all here because we're excited about democracy and government. Um, we're also of a certain level of education. We have certain resources that enable us to have the time to spend a few days at a, at a civic tech conference in Paris. But I think when we talk about broad-based participation, and in particular bringing in some of those more marginalized, typically um, kind of ignored voices, we're talking about people where um, you know participating in a de deliberative exercise over six weekends is probably not an option. So how do we accommodate that question of resources and time and just sheer interest, you know, are we assuming that citizens actually want to be participating to the extent we assume we do when we push for things like digital democracy or broad-based deliberative reforms to the policymaking process? Um, I think another point is being careful about assuming knowledge. This is another sort of conceit of the open policymaking movement is, uh, I mean, I think on the one hand, policymakers often discount the everyday lived experience and knowledge of those on the ground who aren't from typical sort of you know sources of expertise. Um, so we have to challenge that stereotype. But also, I think you know we've seen from certain engagement processes that aren't well designed that citizens often ask for things that are not actually good for them, or that when we're simply aggregating. Um, individual interests, we can get into situations of tyranny of the majority or, you know, where we can't actually push forward progressive policies that en masse are not popular. Um, Canada is pushing forward a carbon tax right now, it has a carbon tax rather. If you were to poll every citizen and put it through a referendum, I don't think we'd have a carbon tax. Yet we know that, I mean, I, I want to tackle climate change so it's a political perspective, but I'm happy that we're putting forward progressive policies in that regard. So I also think we want to be honest with ourselves about, you know, like what happens when we engage on some of these more contentious policy issues where they involve people suffering potentially individual costs for greater collective good. Um, the fourth point is around, you know, where does digital come in to all of this? Um, my experience is that online tools are like for a lot of the policy making, open policy making that governments are leading are not necessarily that helpful in many cases. What they tend to do is scale up the engagement to a degree that is not actually useful. Um, I'm happy to have that view challenged, and I think there's creative ways to use tools, obviously, to tap into perspectives. But when you get into these very qualitative values-based debates, um, those are hard to handle in an online space where you've got many, many participants. Um, and then the last point I'd make is just that I think we have to be careful here about drawing a distinction between engagement on policy making, on policy decisions that are happening earlier in the policy process, so where we're identifying policy problems to address different policy tools or objectives that we want to achieve uh, versus engaging the public on service design. Because by the time you get to the service design or the program design, a lot of those earlier decisions are already made. The actual values-based questions about what we want our government to do, how we want our resources to be expended. Um, by the time you get to the service, it's like, how do we make it work well at the point of transaction? And that's where I think most governments are most enthusiastic right now. I mean, I love your point that governments, like anybody, don't like giving up power. And when you engage citizens earlier in those values-based conversations or, or where you're discussing how we want taxes to be collected or not and how we want them to be expend, uh, expended, um, governments are obviously more hesitant to have those kinds of conversations. Um, but when it's engaging citizens at the point of transaction, it's an easy sell to administrators because that's a way to <coughs> reduce the cost of government. Um, so, you know, I think we have to be careful about saying that the move to user-centered government is about more democratic government, because I don't think it is. I can think of a number of governments right now in Canada that are investing heavily in digital teams to do amazing user-centered design, while at the back end they're cutting all the services that those websites produce. So you can have, the example I like that I was discussing earlier uh, with, with uh, somebody from the French government uh, working on the digital team was, uh, you know, our Ontario government has a beautiful user-centered design interface for applying for student loans. At the same time, that government has just cut the student loans program. So it, it's all well and good to tell me it's a user-centered process, but my user need as a low-income student would be better loans, and the WYSI website is like lipstick on a pig. So I think there's a risk that the more we invest in user-centered design, um, as opposed to thinking as well about engaging citizens on values and preferences, we actually run the risk of really disenchanting citizens, in, in a sense, and that's something that I, I'd love to talk about today. 
Thank you. I think it's very important to remember how different processes might lead to different types of engagement and for what purpose. Because I agree with you that much of the discussion, and Nal and I talk often about this, is around the service delivery, <coughs> the service design, and the policy making, which implies, you know, sharing values and opening up the ideas around values early on in the process. It's something that in the narrative that sells is much less present. So thank you very much for having made that important point. Um, I would like now to leave the floor for questions, interactions, comments from the floor. Maybe keep it short and clear. And uh, if it is directed to one of the panelists, please um, uh, indicate the person. And maybe you can introduce yourself. Sorry, so specific <coughs> issue areas that are going to be up for uh, deliberation. And uh, or maybe more interesting also that you mentioned stuff that perhaps you couldn't push through, that you weren't able to be but maybe considering that would be a good candidate. Of course it's an assembly issue, but, but just you found that perhaps that would just can you can you summarize the answer, the question before you answer? Because it's course. not recorded and people don't listen. Yes. Shall I answer that or we can take it? Well, maybe, maybe we can, can take it, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, thanks, actually. I have a similar question also on the, on the UK experience. First of all, will the decisions be binding on these assemblies? And secondly, is there also a possibility actually for citizens to be involved in which topics or issues should be addressed in these assemblies? And then secondly, a question to Amanda. Are you saying that online tools, or that for many governments, is the are reluctant and involving citizens in the beginning on the discussions on values or which services even to do, what kind of tools would be appropriate or useful in these kind of things? I think we have one here and one there. Um, mm -hmm. So more sort of connection than... Can you use the microphone? You have the advantage of everyone. Okay. <laughs> Thank um, you. So more mentions and it's sort of the theme of the panel, getting, making the, the process more inclusive. Um, and in the UK, there's obvious sections that are specifically barred from voting. So you've got under 18s, um, you've got prisoners uh, that are sectioned, um, there's obstacles that aren't necessarily legal, but homeless people have a lot of, a lot of obstacles. So when you said about sortition being used to ensure that the um, citizens' assemblies are representative, is it a case of increase the inclusion by making it a requirement that the government must specifically and visibly exclude people by virtue of legislation, such as with prisoners, um, rather than, or is everyone in the area being included in this sortition pool? And one question there. Um, my question, unsurprisingly, is about the use of technology and things like citizens' assemblies. I was wondering, I take Amanda's point very seriously, that the, there's no uh, value in jumping to the conclusion that you're going to add to a process by adding on a, a digital element. Um, so I wondered if there were any examples, uh, either in your experience or maybe in Claudia's, of, of really good use of the two in conjunction my own early speculation is maybe that there's some value in storytelling around, so sortition mm. is a very nerdy word, um, but it's very well established in the context of juries. And one of the reasons for that is we have a very culturally embedded concept of how a jury works. There are plays and novels and films about how a jury works. We don't really have that in the sense with some of these um, democratic uh, mechanisms. And I wondered, um, perhaps that's one of the values, but I'd be interested to hear about others. Sure. Okay, so there are a number of questions about the Innovation Democracy Programme, so I'll try and answer them all together. Um, you asked what issues the Citizens' Assemblies will be covering and if there were any that were excluded. Um, I can't really answer that because we haven't decided which local authorities we're going to be working with yet. Um, but it's the, po the issues they can cover are anything that the local authority has jurisdiction over, so that could be uh, local transport policies, could be waste management, could be um, tackling hate crime community cohesion, it could be inclusive growth, it could be anything that that local authority can control and can have a policy on and can do something about, we can have the citizens assembly on. And what government is saying is that we aren't going to dictate that, we don't have any preferences, it has to be what matters to local people and what matters to the local authority in terms of its priority. 
having said that, there was one issue that we had to exclude, um, that we can't cover anything to do with housing and planning, um, because we have such severe housing targets that um, essentially the government was very worried that we might do, it may reverse a decision that is taken in a, a, through a quasi-judicial process, which is the planning process in the UK. So we actually could, we had to kind of steer clear of anything that could um, get in the way of that judicial system or quasi-judicial system, essentially. So we had to exclude that. Um, what we asked when we asked um, local authorities to bid to be part of the program, we asked them to to demonstrate that the issue that they were proposing to us, that they wanted to cover, was one that was a priority issue for their local communities and that they were going to have to deal with kind of in the coming months and years. So the question of whether citizens will be involved in choosing the topics, no, but that's partly a timing issue. Um, but what we've asked the local authorities to prove that when they said we want to work on X issue, they had to approve to us why they know that's a priority for citizens. So it might have come out of surveys they've done, it might have come out of protests that have happened in the local area. So they know this is something people care about. So it isn't just a random thing that the local authority thinks is uncontroversial and easy, it has to be something that is of importance. Um, you asked whether the decisions are binding on the local authorities? Uh, in the first iteration of the programme, yes, they were. And then I spoke to some local authorities and said, so if we made these citizen assemblies binding on you, are you up for it? And they were like, no, no, that's never going to happen. They were never going to get their leader and their chief executives, so the political and the executive leadership, to um, buy into this process if we were basically saying, before the process has even started, you have to commit to delivering what comes out. So we kind of retracted a little bit on that and said, OK, it doesn't have to be binding on you but you need to respond to every recommendation that comes out of the Citizens' Assembly and there has to be a presumption in favour of delivering it. And if you're not going to deliver it, you have to stand up and explain loudly and publicly and transparently exactly why not, because people are going to want to know. Because what we, we know from previous Citizens' Assemblies that have happened around the world is that what comes out of them are really sensible, actionable recommendations. There should be no reason, given all the context and the constraints um, the citizen assembly members will know about exactly the same constraints the local authority would face that um, there is no reason why they shouldn't come out with really sensible recommendations the local authority should put into practice and the last question was about um, whether the citizens assembly make up the membership um, if that's inclusive of everybody or does it exclude in the same way that the voting system excludes people the answer is it's not going to be perfect no it can't be partly for prisoners um, you actually have to be in the room, so you're kind of excluded if you can't get to the meeting room because you're in prison, that's partly an issue. But also, the what, what we're trying to do, though, is make it as inclusive as possible. And so we're not using the electoral rolls as the um, database through which we will um, randomly select because those, in some areas, exclude up to 20% of people, not because they aren't eligible to vote, just because certain community groups, certain um, groups don't actually um, register to vote, and we don't want to exclude them. So the database that we will use is the post office register, which in the UK is the most comprehensive register of addresses and households in the country. So it doesn't exclude people who are homeless. Oh, sorry, it does exclude people who are homeless. It will include somebody who it basically has no fixed abode. So it's not perfect, but it's as good as we can do, given the imperfect system. Last question, Wendy. Yeah, so I had the question of uh, how to, how, like, what by what mechanisms should governments try to engage citizens earlier on, on, on policy work? Um, and I think there, you know, I liked how uh, James Anderson put it this morning, uh, or at lunchtime, which was basically, you know, there's no one vehicle. I think you have to decide which instrument of participation makes sense for the issue at hand. Um, and I think in particular, given your objectives. So if your goal is to produce more robust policy making um, or you know better policy responses then it might mean that you literally do just need to get on the phone with a group of scientific experts or international gov you know an international uh, meeting of, of other governments who've dealt with this and see what work in their context um, if the goal is to raise trust uh, amongst the citizenry on a contentious policy issue and get sort of democratic license to innovate in that space, then you're probably talking about something like a citizens assembly or more of a deliberative forum. Um, if the goal is education, then I think something like participatory budgeting might make sense where, you know, I think one of the outcomes of that sort of an exercise is citizens understanding the hard trade-offs that governments have to make. Um, so it, it takes a lot of um, kind of front-end design 
work in deciding which instrument of engagement to use in the first place, which is why I'm always concerned when I see governments who tend to just do sort of a consultation, like they throw up a white paper or whatever and they say, give us your feedback. Um, and that gets, you know, it kind of is the default form of engagement. I mean, that's pretty thin and probably is appropriate for many problems. And I think often isn't even done with a with the department or the policy shop deciding in the first place what their goal was. So that's some of the work I'd like to see um, happen more. Is, and then I think post facto, some evaluation of whether you actually achieve that objective. And this I'd maybe throw out at the other panelists here is, you know, to what extent from your research and, and work have you found that um, things like citizens' assemblies or deliberative democracy achieve those outcomes? So do we know that they lead to, do, do they grow citizens' levels of trust in the state post facto? Do they see that the decision is more legitimate? Is it just those who immediately participated in the assembly or in the deliberative democracy um, exercise? Or do they, is there a spillover effect where they talk to their social networks about, hey, I participated in this thing, and I learned all this stuff about government, and actually, you know, it's a hard job that they do, maybe we should be a bit more empathetic. Uh, or does it disillusion them? Because we know uh, that sometimes when you see how the sausage is made in government, you have less <laughs> trust in those processes, <laughs> which I think we also shouldn't discount. So I'll, I'll throw that out at you. You want to sure, see? I mean, maybe I'll start from there and then I'll pick up the question earlier. Um, I'm loving all the metaphors. <laughs> and a, I'm a poet at heart, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I think you ask a really good question about what is the impact on those things, and that's one area where there's clearly not enough research yet. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence, so from doing interviews with participants or with, uh, with the organizers of these assemblies, you know that it definitely has a big effect on the people who have participated in them on their sense of agency their sense of efficacy so they they have a greater sense of being able to change mm. things around them and have greater confidence in themselves so I don't think that's a minor thing to be discounted even though it's a small group of people and I think that's where the argument for institutionalizing the use of them mm. so that as many people as possible at least once in their lives have the opportunity to participate um, comes in. There has been some research done um, that's a bit more thorough in Ireland, so I don't know how many people are familiar here, but in Ireland there was um, a citizens convention first and then a citizens assembly, uh, so the latter one uh, was about uh, abortion and repealing the Eighth Amendment, which which lasted for five months, and it was this assembly which recommended to the, the parliament that there should be a referendum on this issue, because in Ireland you need to have a referendum to change the constitution and if, uh, if people vote to change it, this is the way it should be changed. Um, and there, uh, there was a really high proportion of people in the wider public that knew that this happened, um, that, that the researchers who did this work found that lots of this prompted more deliberative interactions within wider society between people. It changed the nature of the kinds of discussions people were having on such a really sensitive and controversial uh, issue, uh, and that people who knew about the assembly were much more likely to vote in favor of the assembly's recommendations. Mm -hmm. So afterwards, we can't get any more wider conclusions than that, but I think it's still something to suggest that it does have an impact um, on things. And then very quickly, so we can have maybe a couple more questions about combining tech with citizens assemblies, because it's also an excellent question. Here, the traditional way has been more to have websites and live streaming to have transparency so that all of the material that experts show the citizens assembly are also available to the wider public. There's nothing kind of hidden in the back room of this is what's going on, no one knows what's happening. Um, I think the storytelling thing you, you point out is really interesting. I think it's starting to happen. There's a short documentary about the Irish citizens assembly I just mentioned called When Citizens Assemble, which if you're interested in this, I recommend you watch. It's actually quite good and I think it does a good job of telling the story, there's a few interviews with people and so on. Uh, but I will, I think the most interesting development there is what's happening in Madrid. Uh, because I guess as a civic tech community, you're, you might be familiar with the platform Decida Madrid, uh, which has been in place for, for a little while now, and it's a platform which uh, citizens can propose ideas which then can, can be taken forward based on a number of votes. Um, and what they've been finding is that it tends to be the people with the most, people and organizations with the most money and resources who have their ideas actually go forward. So to help counter this problem, they've now set up a permanent citizens council 
Council, which they've called the Observatory of the City, and this is 49 residents which will be randomly selected to serve a one-year term, and their role will be to deliberate on these proposals, to also come up with their own proposals, which will then go to, to the City Council. So it's a way of trying to counter this issue of the loudest voices dominating everything to actually give a more representative group of residents uh, the time and space to deliberate and weigh the trade-offs of the proposals and then make recommendations. Thank you. I would like to leave the floor to more if she has any comment or reply to some of the questions that were asked. Um, yeah, no, I think that when uh, we're looking, just to answer Amanda, when we're looking at user center design, when we work with philanthropists, we try to work with them not on their app, but on the process itself. Like, what is the user story of the, like, of the sector they're trying to help, not how to create an app for them to apply to this. Uh, and it's really interesting working with philanthropists and user stories, because all of a sudden they started to think of different points of views that they haven't thought before, specifically try to put it um, even when you write a user story as um, as name of women or names of uh, migrant communities, etc., to help them to go into this type of thinking, and also make sure that they understand the biases of them writing these user stories without having the research done before. Um, so I agree with Amanda that like UX is really nice, not if the service that you like make is not good, but also there is a work corpus of work that was done. Almost a decade ago, by Lauren L. McCann, when, where they write about building with, not for, with um, Jim Anderson was mentioned today, and I think we should all like always refer to it and read it and thinking about like different uses of tech and different uses of face-to-face -face interfaces and others in order to get people minds. Um, and from my experience, by the way, from the Israeli government and also maybe the OGP uh, NAP programs, um, is that a lot of the time the digital tools are used as open washing. So we've done this like brilliant thing and we have like thousands of people saying and then nothing happened with what happened because it just was online and they just pick up the stuff that is happening. So as activists, I point to you that if you see that, also make sure that we are making sure that people know that it's open washing or uh, maybe we should call it deliberate washing uh, or something else because this is like uh, when government tried to get over it and put numbers up and actually don't discuss what was discussed in these platforms is massively damaging and it's happened over and over again and we see it actually in the open government partnership repeatedly so maybe there's uh, some lessons to learn there about how this works and what didn't work and I think the OGP trust fund is looking at that as well so something to think about. Thank you so much more. Unfortunately, because of the late start of the session um, and the... Uh, Sorry, just to say, the afternoon yeah. is going to 4.30. They're going through the break. The door to okay, more... But we have another session. I have to speak. Ah, okay. So anyway, I think there are other engagements and commitments sure. that the panelists have, but thank you very much for the flexibility. So I'd like uh, to leave the floor to Ale for some final remarks. Sorry, I don't want to be the one that cut this short. I do have to be in another session, but maybe that one is also late. So let's try to find a middle ground uh, of uh, acceptable <laughs> level of being late. No, <laughs> uh, listen, this is an amazing discussion. I would like to continue it. And in fact, we could uh, and we can. So that's what online. I will say. <laughs> yeah, well, online more with Barbara. With me being open government in terms of more participatory processes. <laughs> so why am I saying this? There is a, an online component of it. We are collecting good practices of what we call innovative citizen participation. Uh, it's on our website. If you go on the open government uh, page of the OECD website, there is a call for application. It's open until April 12th. We are, we are doing it with the OGP, by the way, also because at UCD we believe a lot in uh, the value of bad practices. Uh, to learn uh, from mistakes, but of course also the value of good practices to, to build uh, on what works. Uh, it's open to governments, but also to civil society. So if you feel that you have done something uh, in this field that is worth mentioning, let us know. It's a very short survey. We may get in touch with you with, for more information. All this will end up in a report. And the reason why we are doing this report is because actually we share all the questions that Amanda asked. We love academics. They ask always the questions. They know there's no answers to. Like I wish we knew exactly, <laughs> and we are. That's your job, <laughs> and, and we are so crazy to think that perhaps the role of organizations like the OECD is to try to give some of these answers. Uh, so this report, uh, the idea is to really see what works and what doesn't, and and, and how to transform these sporadic, anecdotal 
kind of narrative into something more structured that can be implemented in a more uh, um, long-term kind of basis. So please give us your experiences. We have already more than 100, which, we, which I think is amazing that you know, 100 public officials took the time and gave us uh, uh, their experience. Uh, and then also, based on that, we want to create an occasion to discuss and meet and together elaborate uh, the OECD recommendations in this field. At the moment we call it network, but network is a more 1990s kind of concept. So this will be multi-dimensions, will be online, we want to meet. So please get in touch with Claudia, she's in charge of this, uh, if you want to be involved in this discussion. Uh, I think OECD recommendations can be useful to shape some of the actions that governments will take in the future, so you have an opportunity to help us uh, give uh, uh, the indication of where uh, to go. Um, I didn't, I hadn't, hadn't heard before the word open washing, I knew pink okay. washing, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but in fact, that was exactly what I wanted to say at the beginning. We are here to you know, pinpoint to our countries, here you are open washing. <laughs> so this is not really achieving what you want to. We know it's difficult, so we're not criticizing, we are helping. The idea is to be uh, constructive. Uh, and of course technology is the heart of the matter, but it's not the end of it. So that's why we want to build on, on this experience, but we want to use it to achieve uh, the, the objectives. Uh, and concepts like, con um, issues like at what point of the policy cycle, opening up, beginning, during, after. Evaluation, for example, is very nicely done when it's participatory. It's almost never done together with the beneficiaries of a policy. So there are advantages and disadvantages. What levels of government, central versus local? Um, what are the... What issues? What issues, of course. Uh, what are the key stakeholders? Because we can talk about un, you know, underrepresented stakeholders, but these are very different according to the policies, according to how things could be homeless, but uh, uh, you know, can be other issues for other uh, sector. So we have more questions than answers, as I said, uh, but we do believe that the future goes in this direction. And, and also we believe that the future is in the hands of these two community, the digital tech, civic tech community, and the uh, democracy activists, participatory people. Uh, so, so that's why I'm so happy to be here with Barbara and with all of you. And please do get in touch. Uh, we want to work with you on these topics in the future. And thank you to all the panelists. Yeah.